So, how do you follow up an amazing debut season of television that pushed the boundaries of the medium, carved out an entirely new space in the world of black comedy, and left the audience practically begging for more? Well, you do what the writers of season two of Atlanta did. You take everything that worked in season one and you turn it up a notch. In some cases, maybe even a few notches. Season two of Atlanta released in March of 2018, almost two years after season one first aired. And from the very beginning of the season opener, the show was basically warning you that despite the positive path that Earn was on by the end of season one, this season is gonna be a little different for him. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. In many ways, season two of Atlanta feels like a direct continuation of season one and its major themes and motifs. It might be kind of weird to say, but I find that season one and two of Atlanta are very analogous to The Last of Us video game and its sequel, The Last of Us 2. The creator of The Last of Us said that The Last of Us 1 was a story about love, and The Last of Us 2 was a story about hate. In regards to Atlanta, season one is a story about the struggle of being broke and black in America, and season two is a story about the struggles of staying black and not broke in America. God, there's gotta be a better way to say that. Ah oh, well, hopefully you get my point. Season two was sort of like showing the dark side of ambition and what happens when you start to actually gain success. Everybody wants to be successful, but most people are not prepared nor willing to deal with what comes with success. One of my favorite aspects of season two of Atlanta is that it actually has a title. It's called The Robin Season. And yeah, I'd say that's a pretty appropriate title. Robin Season. You ever hey, my fault, bro. Oh, oh, oh. You still need to pay. It's crazy out here, man. It's, it's that time of year, though, I guess. The definition of robbery is the action of taking property unlawfully from a person or place by force or threat of force. And I'll go into more detail about the major connecting theme of robbery later in the video. But for now, I'll just say that this concept is the major driving force of season two's narrative, and the way it's implemented is pretty f genius. Season one of Atlanta was such a breakout hit in 2016 that people expected more of the same when the show came back with the second season. Fans of the show, myself included, couldn't wait to pick things back up with Earn and the gang and see where everything would go after the iconic season one finale, which is clearly why season two opens up with a long scene of two random kids playing FIFA and then talking about buying weed from a local chicken joint, then trying to rob that chicken joint, only for the employees to shoot back at them with an AK-47. I think they actually shoot back at us. Well, of course they're shooting back at us. You're robbing that store. This whole scenario ends with a young girl screaming in confused agony outside of the establishment. This doesn't look like Earn, Paperboy, or Darius at all. As I and many other fans of Atlanta learned the more we watched the show, if there's one thing the writers of this show love more than anything, it's subverting your expectations. Sometimes this obsession with never doing what the audience expects works out pretty well. Sometimes not so much. But this little vignette of a stupid robbery gone wrong feels like a perfect introduction into the Robin season and really sets the tone for what the rest of season two will entail. Two kids find out somebody else is getting money on the low, they make a plan to take what that person has earned, it goes horribly wrong, and in the end, everyone loses. Even the innocent bystanders who just so happen to be near them. But after it's over, it's over. These characters are never mentioned, seen, or heard from again. The world moves on, and the world forgets. Both main and side characters do things that ordinarily would result in drastic repercussions. But in Atlanta, they're usually treated as just not that big of a deal, or everybody just forgets about it after a while and moves on. Someone left a comment on my season one video explaining that this whole phenomenon is basically how the world treats black trauma in real life. Crazy shit happens to black people all the time, but nothing ever really changes to fix it. That's what Atlanta is trying to say with this. I don't know if I fully agree with that as the show's message, but fuck it, I'll go with it. That makes sense to me. But anyway, after this strange opening side story, we finally get to see Earn exactly where we left him at the end of season one, 
sleeping in his makeshift storage room home that would probably cost him $2,500 a month if it was a New York apartment. Earn can't stay in his home for long, though, because it turns out that he's being kicked out. Yeah, you can't stay here anymore. I know you in here, and they coming. Today. Earn, now completely homeless as opposed to just legally homeless, has to find a new place of shelter. Again, his first stop is Al and Darius's place, but he quickly learns that not only is there a new woman named Tara who might be already living there with Paperboy, Al and Darius seem to be at odds over something. And this is the thing, I've never actually been able to figure out why Al and Darius are mad at each other at the start of season two, and their beef only lasts for one episode, so it seems to not be anything important. But hey, if anyone watching this has some inside info or caught some little Easter egg that explains their issue, please let me know in the comments. Al sends Earn on a mission, not that kind of mission, to sort out a potential kidnapping taking place at Al's other residence, which is currently occupied by Al and Earn's uncle. And this is just a funny side note, but I genuinely think that one of Atlanta's greatest achievements as a television series is immortalizing Florida man into modern American culture. Florida man is responsible for a large percentage of abnormal incidents that occur in Florida. Florida man shoots unarmed black teenager. Florida man steals a car, goes to checkers. Florida man beats a flamingo to death. It's also during Earn and Darius's trip that the first mention of Robin season is made. Robin season. Christmas approaches, and everybody gotta eat. We'll be eating. For those that may not know, Robin season is a very real thing, and it's not just in Atlanta. I first heard about Robin season about seven or eight years ago from a coworker around Christmas time. We were both walking out through the lobby of our office when he suddenly stopped walking to point out a giant Christmas tree across the hall. He pointed at the tree and said, quote, See man, this is the type of that make niggas start robbing out here. To which I replied, What? To which he said, Don't like this in people's faces, it's just reminding them of what they can't provide. Which, actually is a pretty good point. This very strange yet enlightening conversation would unfortunately be the last time I ever saw or spoke to this man. And it's not because he got robbed or killed or anything like that. I never saw him again because shortly after this conversation, he got fired for sexually harassing multiple women within the office. What did you say, nigga? Wait, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, Robin niggas. This quote from Darius rings very true, but it can be applied in a greater context outside of just Robin season. The whole eat or be eaten mentality is one that many people have all year round. It's their life's mantra that they live and die on. The world's a sinking ship and there's not enough room on the raft for everyone. To get on that raft, you're most likely gonna have to make sure someone else doesn't get on that raft. I'm not saying that that mentality is the right one to have or that it's even an accurate depiction of what the world is really like, but many people believe it to be true and that mentality is ultimately at the core of season two's narrative. And for Earn and Al, it's what drives them to make many of the crucial decisions that they do throughout the story. Once Darius and Earn get to Earn's uncle's place, they find a woman trapped in a room, an alligator locked in another room, and f***ing Cat Williams at the head of it all. The vibes here are just so intense. Yeah, the same Cat Williams who had a recent resurgence into relevance and popularity at the start of this year with that all-time iconic tirade slash interview with Shannon Sharp. Just to protect my integrity and that virgin hole I was telling you about. <laughs> right, because uh, P. Diddy be wanting to party. And you gotta tell him no. Oh, you Lord. got to tell him no. An interview where he basically predicted the soon coming exposure of Hollywood's elite. But back in 2018, Cat Williams was seen as a sort of failure, as a damn, what could have been type of celebrity. A black entertainer with a unique voice and an abundance of talent and intelligence that just seemed to resonate with millions of people. But unfortunately, alleged drug use and an inability to conform with what the system was demanding of him led to his pseudo blackballing from the industry. The man Cat Williams and the character of Earn's uncle that he plays in Atlanta are very appropriately similar. In fact, I'd say that Donald Glover and the Atlanta writing staff specifically wrote this part for Cat Williams and no one else. Earn and his uncle's conversation near the end of this episode is critical in understanding who Earn is as a person and why he so desperately wants to escape and never go back to the struggle. What I'm scared of is being you. 
you know, someone everybody knew was smart, but ended up being a know-it-all fuck-up Jay that just let shit happen to him. I am scared about Al leaving me. He don't need me like that anymore. He's... And if you don't want to end up like me, get rid of that chip on your shoulder shit. It's not worth the time. There were just so many gems from this conversation with Ern and his uncle that sometimes I just rewatch these scenes by themselves. The episode very strangely ends with Cat Williams giving Ern a gold-plated pistol and saying that he was going to need that in the music industry. Ern then heads back to Al's place and the mission is kind of completed, but not really. But just when Ern thinks he has a chance of staying with Al and Darius, one of the absolute best characters in the show and the absolute worst person ever slides in at the last second and gives Ern what would turn out to be very prophetic advice. <laughs> you better get rid of that gun, nigga. <laughs> this is Tracy, Al's friend from back in the day who just got out of prison, and Al is actually lending him the guest room until he gets back on his feet. Spoiler, he never gets back on his feet. So for Ern, he gets another Tough break, nigga. Episode two was called Sport and Waves, and this episode can be broken down into two parts. The first part is about Ern and Paperboy going to a label slash streaming service headquarters to show them the music that they've been working on, but also to promote Paperboy as an artist that they can push on their platforms. The second half of the episode is about Ern and the newest member of the crew, Tracy, going to the mall together. Sounds innocent enough. Hey, fuck yo! There's also a little plot about Darius and Al trying to find a new plug to get weed from. The story of Darius and Al isn't that interesting in this episode, but what is interesting is the reason that Al needs to find a new plug. And that's because the episode actually starts with what is easily the funniest robbery ever depicted on film. Hey, yo, man. You ever... Hey, my fault, bro. Hey, man. I'm sorry about this shit, man. I'm gonna pay you back, man. Appreciate you, man. Seriously, this might just be the funniest scene in the show to me. I could watch this sh over and over again. But this scene is a perfect way to introduce Al or Paperboy's mental state and dilemma throughout this season. This whole rapper thing is starting to really pop off for him, but due to his higher profile, he's not able to sell or even buy drugs with the same freedom that he once had. This has led to rap being his main source of income. And even though he's blowing up, as any rapper would tell you, the money is definitely slow at first. Paperboy is still making mixtapes at this point. He's not even signed to a real label. The money he's getting at this stage is mostly from local shows and club appearances, which, as we saw in season one, don't always guarantee big paydays. Al is someone who does have the eat or be eaten mentality, and he knows that he has a lot of people, himself included, that he has to provide for. He also knows that a rap career is not guaranteed, and even if it does happen, most rap careers don't last for long. He wants to get as much money as possible, as quickly as possible, before his window closes and his bubble bursts. As he learns throughout this season, keeping Earn as his manager might not be the best way to achieve that fast success. Earn and Al are paraded through this music building, talking with execs and other employees about Paperboy. But at every turn, it seems that Paperboy is not quite gelling with the new age of music. Earn's inability to even get Al's music played through the speakers and Al's clear disdain and disinterest in the situation, juxtaposed with the clip of a younger rapper in the other office dancing on the table as a bunch of white executives watching with glee, is a perfect illustration of Al's struggle. Also, just for context, Clips of young rappers dancing in front of music business execs became kind of common in this time, and there's always been a strange Sambo type of vibe to it all, at least for me. I also can't help but relate this to Donald Glover's real experiences as Childish Gambino, as I'm sure a lot of these moments came from his own life and music career. But one rapper who does seem to fit the modern mold, more than Paperboy at least, is a rapper named Clark County. Earn and Paperboy run into Clark County and his manager at the headquarters. The meeting is casual enough, but this is just the introduction of Clark County. Him and his manager will come back and will be brought up in conversation many times throughout the season. And as funny and interesting as the first half of this episode is, the part that I love the most is the true introduction of Tracy. We're trying to- oh! Run, nigga, run! Damn, yo, you Fulton County police or something? The way they dive into depression and 
especially after what he did to her daughter, I was like, like can I even feel bad for this horse anymore? Tracy is loud, obnoxious, selfish, disrespectful, impulsive. He has no idea how to read a room. And truth be told, he's kind of a horrible person. But goddamn, is he funny. They got a no chase policy. They can't stop me. He got to keep giving me great customer service. That's all he could do. Hey, excuse me, sir. Hey. Tracy is the most likably hateable character that I think I've ever seen in a show. And I feel like he was mostly added to the group in season two for the boost in comedy, but his incredibly selfish, impulsive, and reckless decisions cause major problems for Earn later in the season. Well, they also cause Earn problems in this episode too, because their trip to the mall all stems from Earn finally getting his money from that breeder that Darius connected him with in season one. Yeah, remember that? Once Tracy hears that Earn hit a nice come up, he offers to double that money through mall gift cards. Earn is hesitant at first, but after Al backs Tracy's claims, Earn agrees to let Tracy double his money. This, of course, ends horribly with Tracy not telling Earn that the cards are an illegal scam until it's too late, almost getting Earn arrested for fraud. I do find it funny how Darius helped Earn get that money in season one through slightly sketchy means, and Tracy ends up wasting that money through slightly sketchy means in season two. It really helps illustrate the difference in trajectory that Earn is headed for in this season. Episode three is called Moneybag Shawty, and it's all about money. Money is something that Earn has never really had in abundance before. Well, not until he gets his first streaming royalties check, that is. See, after a sad white woman made a viral video about Paperboy's song, that song skyrockets up the charts and ends up making both Paperboy and Earn a lot of money. White tears. And fun fact, this scene of the white woman complaining about this song is actually based off of a real life event of a very similar sad white woman making a viral video complaining about the Vince Staples song, North North. Fuck in the whip, slide right back in the function, one wrong word, start busting. And something I've noticed about both the Boondocks and Atlanta is that as the shows progressed with more seasons, they started to pull for more real life material to craft the episodes around. This episode here being one of the first examples. But back to the episode, after making all this new money, Earn decides that he wants to stunt and or flex his newfound wealth, but he quickly realizes that money isn't everything it's cracked up to be. Or you at least need more than just money to really matter in today's world. Everywhere he goes, he just ends up getting exploited and arguably flexed on by other people. This is an interesting lesson for people who get money for the first time and think they have everything that they need. If you don't know how to move with money, then you're likely going to blow through it all just as fast as you got it. Financial literacy and financial discipline are two very important skills that many people fail to develop or are just never taught. But they're both critically important to maintaining wealth. Without them, you just become another target to get robbed. Earn's story ends with him convincing himself that he can beat Michael Vick in a foot race and I don't know if everyone who's watching this video knows who Michael Vick is, but I'll just show you this picture and tell you that to me, as a kid, this Michael Vick was the closest thing to a real life superhero I had ever seen. I say all that to say this, Earn loses the race. It's Michael Vick. The other plot of this episode is Paperboy and Darius linking up with Clark County Yoo -hoo. for a studio session. And this studio session starts pretty fun and harmless, but things eventually get dark. You need to stop playing, dog. Man, I'm okay? Not, I'm not playing. The first thing I want to mention about Clark County is that I've seen a lot of fans of the show say that Clark County is supposed to be Chance the Rapper, but I don't know if I quite believe that. For one, as he says in this episode, Clark County doesn't smoke or drink. Anyone who's listened to Chance the Rapper in the earlier days knows that Chance was a very heavy drug user at this time. Also, Donald Glover and Chance are supposed to be very good friends, so I doubt that Donald would put such a depiction of his friend in a show like this. But whoever Clark County is supposed to be, I have heard that the studio session depicted in this episode was something that Donald Glover has witnessed in real life. Take from that what you will. But I do really love this whole sequence because it shows a very darker side to Clark County that he clearly does not want the general public to know about. If it crashes again, 
I'm gonna crash my foot in your ass. Fix that shit, okay? It's also important to note that Clark County mentions that it's his manager who gets him all the good connections that he has in the industry, and he tells Paperboy that he should hit him up if he wants to get in on those opportunities. Hmm. I wonder if Al will take him up on that. Snow, I hate it. With your little snotty foreshadowing. Episode four is called Helen, and it's probably my least favorite episode of season two. And I know how this looks with last season's van heavy episode being my least favorite of season one and this van heavy episode being my least favorite of season two. But I swear, it's just a coincidence. I, I, I love black women, okay? Go tell that to your white bitch. But really, what I dislike about this episode is that I generally don't like watching toxic couples go back and forth about whether they want to be together or not. And that's basically this episode to a T. Ern and Vanessa's relationship is definitely complicated, and I do care about them ending up together. But their toxic situationship is also way less interesting than pretty much every other major arc and character dynamic in the show. I don't think this episode is bad, and I actually think the acting is really good on both parts. It's just not as entertaining as the other episodes in the season. But all you need to know is that Ern and Van break up at the end of it. Aww. That's it. Pretty much nothing else important happens in this episode. I don't know, unless you like weird German sh Episode 5 is actually a pretty lighthearted story for an Atlanta episode. It's called Barbershop. And for most black men, the barbershop is a very important cultural touchstone. Barbershops are where black men of all ages come to talk and argue about anything from sports to entertainment to politics to the goings on of their local neighborhood to, to anything. There's also a certain bond and connection that every black man builds with their barber. Once you find a barber that cuts your hair right, you're basically in a, hopefully, non-sexual relationship with that man. Meaning that once you find that barber, you don't cheat or find another barber. If your barber is out on vacation the same week that you need a cut, you better start wearing hats until they get back. This kind of bond can create a very toxic dynamic in codependency. And if you f around and choose the wrong barber, you might end up in a situation like Paperboy. There's really not much to analyze in this episode outside of this. I just think Bibby is hilarious and I wish he was in the show more. Oh, you got somewhere to be? Yes, baby man. Episode six, though, is called Teddy, and it's a little different than episode five. Episode six is all about Darius, which I think is the first episode that can say that. At this point in the show, Darius is still a bit of an unknown in terms of who he actually is and what his story is all about. So this episode is our first real insight into answering some of those big questions. The plot of the episode is that Darius is driving up to a secluded mansion outside of Atlanta to get a piano that he bought on some sort of internet marketplace. The owner of the piano ends up being this very creepy looking man named Teddy Perkins. Keen eyes and ears will realize that Teddy Perkins is actually Donald Glover in whiteface. And man, what an amazing and hilarious performance Donald puts on in this episode. The Keith Stanfield too. Everyone did good in this episode. But as creepy as things seem in the beginning, they only get creepier and more dangerous the longer Darius stays in the mansion. Darius comes to learn that Teddy Perkins is the brother of Benny Perkins, a very famous fictional pianist who wrote music with many great black musicians of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Darius also comes to learn that both Benny and Teddy were basically abused into greatness by their father as kids. For anyone watching this who hasn't caught on yet, Teddy Perkins is supposed to represent Michael Jackson. Actually, not just Michael Jackson but also many great black male musicians of yesteryear who had very tragic lives and deaths. Michael Jackson, Marvin Gaye, hell, Teddy Pendergrass has the same first name and first initial of the last name. Artists like Teddy Perkins and Michael Jackson ended up becoming very rich and successful, but in relation to the theme of season two, they were both robbed of a childhood and robbed of their happiness and freedom to be what they might have wanted to be if not for their overbearing and abusive fathers. This episode plays out like a true horror movie, and it's one of the best examples of just how much range Atlanta had as a series in terms of how it could grip and captivate its audience. It doesn't always need to be funny. It didn't always need to be about rap or poverty. 
the show really could make a story about anything, and as long as it still had that unmistakable Atlanta feel and charm, it would be a success. I also really like what Teddy Perkins says about sacrifice, but also what Darius gives as a rebuttal. My father used to say, great things come from great pain. Not all great things come from great pain. Sometimes it's love. Not everything's a sacrifice. This may be a one-off filler episode, but it absolutely deserves the recognition and praise that it's gotten over the years. It's one of the show's greatest achievements. And now we go to episode seven. Say, Drake, have you seen episode seven of Atlanta? It's mostly about you and your great parties that you throw. You know, the ones where you bundle up a bunch of women in vans and ship them off into secluded areas and compounds filled with rich and powerful men and give them a series of rules and guidelines that they have to follow or else. Mm. Bro, no, they ship them in. Dre bringing like 400 bitches to the house. I was like, oh, word. I don't know who, who curates all this stuff. Should I even be talking about this? Bro, Probably 400? Like, Listen, know, we know. Just kidding. Drake doesn't watch these videos. Probably. But man, am I glad that I waited after the Kendrick and Drake beef to talk about this <laughs> This episode is all about Van and her group of friends, who we sadly never really see again after this episode. But basically, it's about them getting gussied up to go to a party, but not just any party. This is a Drake party. They all have their own reasons for going to this Drake party. Van's one bougie friend who got them the invite is just trying to sleep her way into fame and relevance. Van's other friend is only going to meet a very specific black actor, and Van herself is only going to forget about Earn and try to find some happiness for herself. Drake has been accused of some very not cool things over the past few months. But looking back at this episode and also having the context that the Childish Gambino song This Is America was originally supposed to be a Drake diss leads me to believe that for whatever reason, Donald Glover does not seem to like Drake very much. And this episode was supposed to serve as some sort of diss or whistleblowing on all those weird Drake shenanigans that we've been enlightened to recently. But back in 2018, most of us had no clue of the severity of this shit. Oh look, Darius is here too. But I know Drake's chef, Guillermo, from the glorious days of pickup soccer. And he doesn't really have much of a purpose in this episode. He's mostly just talking about crazy existential theories about what the world really is and where we all really come from. Nothing out of the ordinary here. This episode is mostly just about how fake the A-list party scene is and how everybody just wants the clout of saying that they were with some celebrity, even though it's all just a facade. The episode is a funny side adventure and it's cool to see a story about four black women be so well-written and genuinely hilarious. When it comes to episode eight, let me just ask you this. Have you ever had a really bad day? Well, Al has, and that's what episode eight is all about. Episode eight is called The Woods, and it's the glorious return to the main story arc. This episode takes place on the birthday of Al's mother, who a tentative fans will remember is no longer alive. The episode starts with Al in a hazy dreamlike state, imagining his mother talking to him from the kitchen as he lies on the couch. Al eventually gets a text from Ern, asking him if he's all right, considering what the day is and Al shrugged it off and says that he's good. Based on what little we know of Alfred's mother at this point in the story, we can guess that he was very close with his mother, or at the very least, her death left a very strong impact on him. A lot of times, people like Al, breadwinners who do morally questionable things to provide for themselves and others, have a lot of trauma that they have to repress deep within themselves. They put up emotional walls and barriers to keep people from knowing the pain and sadness that they feel beneath it all. Al is not pretending to be the gangster rapper he portrays to the public. That is truly a part of who he is. There's also the side of him that misses his dead mother and is afraid and unsure of how to move forward without her. This inner turmoil has been brewing since the start of the series, but it all comes to a head in this episode when Al goes on a date with a female artist who he thinks has a genuine connection with him. As Al spends more time with this woman though, he realizes that her interest in Al is more about business than it is about a real connection. They eventually get into an argument about Al needing to stop trying so hard to be himself and just learn to compromise his morals to get ahead in the music industry. As I said about Al many times in these videos, if there's one thing he never wants to do, it's compromise his morals to get ahead in the music industry. I ain't in all that fake shit. I'm just trying to stay real. If you on the radio and you making money, you been not real. Al decides to part ways with his female companion, but unfortunately, 
she was also his ride, so Al then has to trek through the woods of Atlanta to get home. It's during this long walk that he runs into some teenagers who turn out to be fans. And then, of course, they become fans with a gun with no witnesses who can easily rob Paperboy. And just so we're keeping count, this is now the second time this season that Paperboy has been robbed at gunpoint. Tough break, nigga. Paperboy fights off his attackers and manages to flee into the deep woods of Atlanta. It's here that he runs into yet another Atlanta character who could be real or fake. This crazy homeless man. This crazy homeless man follows Al through the woods, asking him seemingly nonsensical questions and mocking Al's inability to find his way home. All this starts harmless enough. That is, until the homeless man pulls out a knife and puts it to Al's throat. Keep standing still. You're gone, boy. Yeah, not so funny now. Earlier in the episode, the woman Al was dating mentioned that Al should get a new manager to replace Ern. Maybe you gotta level up. Get you a manager with a big dick. Yo, girl, I don't know nothing about all that. This is now the second or third person to mention getting rid of Ern this season. For a lot of people, part of escaping the struggle involves trying to take people with you who might be holding you back. It's always your decision if you want to do the extra work needed to make sure that they don't get left behind. But that decision is usually a very tough one. At the end of the day, everyone in Paperboy's situation has to make a decision. A big decision. Be real and limit your opportunities or play the game to stay in the game. In my opinion, neither choice is inherently wrong. Sometimes to make a living for yourself and achieve the goals that you've set, you got to do what you got to do, even if that means compromising some of your morals. And on the other hand, it's incredibly honorable and admirable to remain staunch in your convictions and stay true to whatever code you have, even if it means that you will never reach the heights that you plan to because of those convictions. This uncertainty about his emotions and how to go forward in his career leads him to become literally lost in the woods of Atlanta. Anyway, Paperboy runs as fast as he can and eventually trips and stumbles his way out of the woods and back into civilization. It's moments after his escape that, for the first time in the show, we see Al break down in tears after all the traumatic shit that he had just been through. The episode ends with Al meeting a random fan at a nearby gas station and Despite his usual standoffishness with fans and all the blood and dirt on his face and clothes, he decides to pose for a pic with the kid, showing that he really has made the decision to play the game. At least a little bit. Episode 9 is called North of the Border, and it's up there with some of my favorite Atlanta episodes of all time. The setup for the episode is that days after Al's traumatic night in the woods, Earn has set up a concert at a local Atlanta college, but Earn being Earn, he gets the cheapest and most sketchy living arrangements possible for the crew. He basically gets the gang set up to live with Paperboy's number one fan, who just so happens to be a bat crazy college girl. I had a dream about you. We were holding each other naked by this river, and then I ate you. Anyone who has ever dealt with a crazy woman knows exactly how awkward slash terrified Paperboy is in this scene. To Ern's dismay and against his wishes, Al also allows Tracy to come along on the trip. And this is all under the ridiculous guise that he'll be the bodyguard for the crew. Tracy, though, takes this role very seriously. And when the girl that everyone is staying with catches Paperboy talking to another woman, how dare he, she pours a drink on him, which causes Tracy to track her down. And before Ern can de-escalate the situation, Tracy... You do your thinking with a one-track mind up your rap your story's getting dusty luckily though Ern catches her just before she lands and she you know thanks him as you would expect her to <laughs> this causes a slight brouhaha which is turned into a much bigger brouhaha when Tracy sneaks one of the dudes who were pressing Ern Allen Darius and then this leaves the crew running for their lives through the campus Eventually, the group finds shelter and safety in a white frat house. And while at this white frat house, the show decides to give us one of the funniest yet most disgusting scenes that I will ever not be able to play on YouTube. But after the horde of naked white pledges are done shaking their dicks to mid 2000s snap music, yes, that's what was happening in that scene, Ern and Al are finally left alone with each other for the first time in a while. We've seen everything that Al has gone through this season all the doubt and uncertainty that he's had to deal with regarding his career. It's robbing season. It's eat or be eaten. He shows how hard it really is to not only make money, but to maintain money and turn money into true wealth. 
It's hard enough for the average man, but as a black man in an industry that feeds off of building up black men and then destroying them, he doesn't have time to make mistakes, and he also doesn't have room for dead weight. As much as he loves Earn, and as much as he wants the best for Earn, Earn has proven over and over again to be a liability as his manager. And just like people have been telling Paperboy all season, he could be doing a lot better with someone else managing his career. I've been talking to Clark County's manager, man. About what? The fuck you think, Earn? Managing me. Actually managing me, man. Shit I could be getting, shit I should be getting out here. This conversation is not Paperboy outright firing Earn, but it's him letting Earn know that for the first time since they started this whole thing together, he's strongly considering it. I love this scene for how well acted and how well paced it is, but I hate watching this scene for how heartbreaking it is to watch Al blindside Earn and crush his hopes and dreams to his face like this. As I mentioned earlier, in order to escape the struggle, you will most likely have to decide whether or not to cut certain people out of your life, certain people who don't benefit your situation. Even if you love them and want them to shine with you, the first step to the path of least resistance is often throwing those people overboard. Episode 8 showed us that Paperboy wants to survive. Episode 9 showed us what he's willing to do to survive. The rest of the episode is basically Earn grappling with the idea that his big plan that he believed was going so well is now imploding from within. And he's about to be completely f The next morning, the guys get back to the dorm only to find all of their cut up and left on the lawn. First, Al freaks out. Then Earn freaks out and has to be dragged away by the others after pulling the fire alarm. And then on the ride back, we get to see quite possibly the saddest fight scene in television history. After everything that Earn has been through on this trip, and after all that he's just lost, the only thing that he really has left to lose is his pride. And when Tracy, the man that Earn blames for most of his current problems, does what Tracy does and starts talking and doesn't shut the f up, Earn decides that he'll be the one to shut him the f*** up. Yo, pull this car over so I can fight this nigga. Fight this nigga? Earn. Yeah. And he challenges him to a fight. Y'all remember Dragon Ball Z when Videl tried to fight Spopovich? Yeah. This was a lot like that. Earn ends up getting dog walked by Tracy, and after he drags his mangled and beaten body back into the car, the boys have a very quiet and awkward ride home. Remember, kids. Pride is a fool's fortress. Fuck pride. Pride only hurts. Episode 10 is yet another out of the ordinary Atlanta episode. This time though, they take it way back to the early 1990s slash 2000s era. Back when dip set, oversized jerseys, and blade movies were the coolest things around. Oh yeah, and FUBU, which is the title of the episode. This episode is all about Earn and Al as kids in middle school, and it gives you all the warm, nostalgic memories from your public school days. Fights on the bus, kids ridiculing substitute teachers, passing notes in class or texting in class for the younger generation, and of course, bullying each other for the most minuscule and minor differences or inadequacies. <sighs> Can't say I miss it much. But the basic plot is that Earn's mom buys him a FUBU jersey on sale, which is what you're definitely not supposed to do. And when little Earn goes to school the next day, it turns out there's another kid in the class with the same FUBU jersey, only he claims that his is real, which must make Earns fake. I'm sure to some of you watching this video, this must seem like a very dumb thing to argue over, and trust me, it is. But back in the day, and hell, even now, people love roasting and bullying people over wearing knockoff brand name clothes. Being a kid in that era and getting caught wearing knockoff sh was basically a death sentence. Oh no, y'all wearing fake FUBU now. <laughs> You were forever a broke-ass loser to everyone who ever knew you if you got caught in some Phoebe or some Ekans or anything else fake like that. So little Earn spends the entire day trying to figure out how not to be exposed for wearing fake FUBU. At the end of the episode, once Earn gets cornered by his classmates fully ready to expose them for wearing fake FUBU, it's his cousin Little Alfred who saves the day by confidently proclaiming that the other kids don't know what they're talking about and convincing them that clearly Earn's jersey is real and that jersey is fake. And because they're little kids, 
they just agree because they don't know any better. So of course, the other kids end up relentlessly roasting the kid who actually had the real FUBU jersey on, and Earn is free to enjoy the rest of his day without the threat of being labeled as a broke-ass loser. Earn feels good about himself, and he's happy that he escaped the situation. That is, until he comes to school the next day, and here's the announcement that the kid who got the roasting that Earn deserved ended up killing himself the night after the FUBU mix-up. This, understandably, shakes little Earn to his core. I've said it many times in this video, but this just further hammers home the major theme of this season. It's robbing season. Your success is someone else's failure. Your come up is someone else's downfall. Your escape is someone else's doom. It's either you, them, or both of you. If you don't want it to be you, then you're probably gonna have to do some things that you're not proud of. This episode serves two points. One is that it further emphasizes the themes of robbing season like I just explained, but also it helps to emphasize Earn and Al's relationship after showing that it just hit its lowest point. Al has always been there for Earn when he needed it most, and Earn has always looked to Al to get him out of the tough spots that he gets himself into. Fast forward 20 years later, and sadly, it seems like nothing has changed in that dynamic. But before I move on to the next episode, I do want to bring up how incredibly accurate all of these little depictions of public school life were in this episode. From the kids' stupid jokes to the girl who one day is very confrontational with the teacher, but is the happiest and most eager student the next. And also just how completely fickle the students were when it came to picking a target to make fun of. This isn't true for everybody, but for a lot of kids growing up in America, the public school system is the hellscape that taught us how to hate ourselves and the people around us as well. And in just one episode, Atlanta did a beautiful job of illustrating that entire feeling. The season finale of season two is called Crabs in a Barrel, which is a phrase that I've already broken down on this channel in videos before. It specifically fits the ending of this episode very well. The episode is actually pretty similar to the finale of season one in that it's mostly about Earn going all over the place, interacting with different main and side characters. The difference is that at the end of season one, Earn's life was heading in a positive direction. At the end of season two, everything in Earn's life seems to be falling apart and heading back towards the struggle. Despite that, there's still things that he has to take care of. He still needs to be there for Lottie and Van and also show up to Lottie's parent-teacher conference, even though he and Van are no longer together. He still needs to take care of his managing duties for Paperboy, like setting up their flight to Europe for Paperboy's new tour with Clark County, even though Ern and Al are not on the best terms and Al is considering firing him at the moment. And he still needs to keep up appearances with all of these people so that they don't worry about him. The only person Ern is able to confide in is Darius, who gives Ern a pretty eloquent speech about failure that beautifully contrasts with many of the things that Ern himself has said about failure in the past. No, I know. You know. I see you, man. I see you. Learning. Learning requires failure. I was just trying to make sure you ain't failing in, in his life. This all culminates in the crew getting ready to board the plane and go through TSA and customs, only for Earn to shockingly be reminded of the wisest words he never listened to. You better get rid of that gun, nigga. You better get rid of that gun, nigga. You better get rid of that gun, nigga. <laughs> well, sh In case anyone watching this is unaware, being caught in the airport with an unlicensed firearm is basically one of the worst things that can happen to you at the airport. We're talking jail time with serious charges. With Earn put in this precarious situation, given everything that he's gone through and been taught about the world and his place in it, what do you think he does next? Does he A, calmly tell TSA that there's a gun in his bag and he doesn't know how it got there? B, say, F it, cock the gun back and air that bitch out like a real nigga would? C, Hide the gun in someone else's bag so that they get caught instead of earn. Or D, just walk back through the line and throw his bag in the trash or something. It, it's C. The answer is always C. Once they get on the plane, Paperboy tells Earn that he saw what he did and he praises him for it. Niggas gonna do whatever they gotta do to survive because they ain't got no choice. He ain't got no choice either. He says that's the type of shit that he wants Earn to be doing as his manager. And this is a nice, heartwarming moment and all, until Clark County walks by them in the aisle, and Earn and Paperboy ask him why his manager isn't there. 
Clark County explains that his manager got caught with a gun in his bag and Paperboy plays it off as if he had no idea that that was happening. It's not until Clark County walks away that Earn lets Al in on the crucial detail that it was actually Clark County's bag that Earn put the gun into, which means Clark County either then put the gun into his own manager's bag or he made his manager take the fall for him. And now Clark County and Paperboy are about to go on a whole European tour together with Clark County potentially believing that Earn and Al tried to set him up. And that's where the season ends, with all the crabs thrown neatly into the barrel. There's obviously a lot to analyze and dissect with season two of Atlanta. Even with this video being as long as it is, there's still a lot of topics, concepts, and themes that I didn't cover fully or just left out completely due to them not being directly related to the connecting theme of the struggle. I always struggle between which season I like more, season one or season two of Atlanta. But after rewatching season two for the sake of this video, I think I'm going to have to go with season two as the better season. Season one tells a great contained story of a down on his luck man slowly rising to prominence. But season two weaves such an intricate tale of that same man's descent that it feels like you can't tell the story of one without the other. When it comes to the eat or be eaten mentality that permeates throughout season two, I have to say that I understand where it comes from and why so many successful people subscribe to it. But I also think that it ends up breeding the same mindset that will eventually lead to many of those people's fall from greatness. That toxic mindset of constantly trying to get ahead of the next man. It can leave you without any good people around you. It can make you obsessed with wanting more and more out of life, ultimately leaving you unfulfilled when there's no more that you can reasonably conquer or attain. Everyone needs a dream to chase and everyone needs to have something they're passionate about. But allowing your passion and that drive to survive to convince you to cast people out of your life is a slippery slope to walk. Be careful of who you trust and be even more careful of who you betray. Because everyone is trying to eat. And the last thing you want to do is make yourself another target. <laughs>